Chapter 16 Sarcophagus Yefim Slavsky, the Minister of Medium Machine Building, 88 years old but still standing tall, arrived in Chernobyl on May the 21st, almost a month after the explosion. He was considered the uncrowned king of the Soviet nuclear program. The reasons for his delayed arrival were numerous, but they weren't his fault. The Chernobyl accident had taken place at a plant not operated by his ministry, but everyone knew that the exploded reactor was his brainchild, and that of the academic institutes he had helped to build and fund. A virtual empire that employed tens of thousands of civilian and military personnel. The Chernobyl-type RBMK reactors had first been built, run, and promoted by Slavsky's ministry. After the accident, many in the party and government tried to distance themselves from the once all-powerful minister, but ultimately they had no choice but to turn to him. Slavsky's experience in dealing with nuclear emergencies, coupled with the enormous human and technological resources his ministry commanded, were needed now as never before. On May the 15th, the Politburo had put Slavsky and his ministry in charge of burying the exploded reactor, which had to be sealed permanently to stop the further spread of radiation. It was up to Slavsky to decide how to do it. He took charge immediately. Five days later, he created a special construction directorate within his ministry to deal with the problem and appointed a general to head it. The engineers and architects came up with a number of possible solutions. One of them called for burying the reactor under a mound of sand, concrete, and balls of metal. There were also proposals to erect an arch or an umbrella-like structure above the reactor. Eventually it was decided to build a concrete structure incorporating foundations, walls, and other elements of the reactor building that remained intact after the explosion. Time was of the essence. The Politburo wanted the reactor buried within four months, and building a protective structure that utilized the remaining parts of Unit 4 was the fastest way to deal with the problem. Officially, the new building above the reactor was referred to as the shelter. Unofficially, it became known as the sarcophagus. Slavsky became the main architect, priest, and undertaker of the concrete coffin. Coming up with quick, cost-efficient, and almost always temporary fixes for complex problems, achieved with the help of invariably limited technical resources and usually unlimited human ones, had been the essence of Slavsky's whole career and of the Soviet nuclear industry in general since its inception. There could have been no better choice than Slavsky to build the sarcophagus that would put not only a damaged reactor, but also a whole epoch in the development of the Soviet nuclear energy program to rest. His first experience in dealing with the consequences of a nuclear accident had come in 1957 at the Mayak, or Beacon, military nuclear plant in the closed city of Ozersk. At the time, Slavsky was just beginning his ministerial career, having been appointed barely two months earlier. It was on his watch that the Soviet method of fighting radioactive contamination, covering the affected areas with a thick layer of concrete, was born. Almost thirty years later, in Chernobyl, that was still the default solution. In early June 1986, the Politburo approved plans for the construction of the sarcophagus, which was designed by a group of architects and engineers in Leningrad, led by Vladimir Kurnosov. Slavsky now mobilized all the academic, industrial, and military cadres under his command. It was a military-style operation, with Slavsky as commander-in-chief, he was always eager to make an appearance on the front lines. Having dealt with numerous nuclear accidents without losing his unique capacity for work, the aged minister dismissed the negative effect of small doses of radiation. On May the 21st, his first day at the Chernobyl plant, he had flown over the damaged reactor on a helicopter and then approached the remains of the fourth unit on foot. He walked with two of his aides to the third reactor building, telling them, We'll have a drink afterward, and it will all pass. But we have to take a good look and figure out what's going on here. Slavsky's subordinates recalled that the levels of radiation were crazy, and that on walking up to the damaged reactor, 
Slavsky told his aides to stay behind. I'm an old man and have nothing to fear, but you are still young. Slavsky's personnel divided the construction site into twelve sectors, each run by one of the many construction firms within his huge empire. Whole towns emerged around the damaged unit, new roads and railway lines, as well as entire concrete-producing plants, were built in the vicinity. First, as in Ozersk, back in 1957, they covered the highly contaminated areas around the reactor with concrete, thereby turning them into relatively safe construction sites. Even so, trucks bringing concrete to the reactor had to be unloaded behind concrete walls, where the radioactivity level reached 50 Röntgen per hour. Orders were issued to the major machine-building plants in Ukraine and the rest of the Soviet Union for new equipment and elements of the sarcophagus structure designed by Slavsky's engineers. The Ukrainian authorities already had their hands full, helping to fulfill the government commission's orders for people, materials and equipment. Italian equipment was brought in to build the foundations of the sarcophagus, while powerful pumps from West Germany were used to supply concrete in order to build the walls sealing off the reactor. The first cadres whom Slavsky sent into battle after doing the reconnaissance himself were military men. General Yuri Savinov, a member of Slavsky's advance group, spoke of his task as one of preparing for a landing by a military unit with orders to defeat a new and invisible enemy, radiation. The military performed two functions, decontamination and construction. By early June, a total of 20,000 officers and men, mostly reservists, had been organized into construction battalions. The fact that they were being assigned to Chernobyl was concealed from many of them. Those who knew where they were going were often promised salaries five times higher than usual. Although the promises proved empty, the recruits worked with discipline and devotion. The only protests registered by the KGB had to do with overexposure to radiation. On June the 2nd, 200 reservists refused to eat meals after the battalion commander and commanders of two companies, having sustained the maximum dose of 25 Röntgen, left their units. But 170 soldiers who had already been exposed to that dose stayed in the area. Overexposure to radiation remained an issue until the very end of the building of the sarcophagus. Those who approached the reactor first had to deal with radiation levels ranging from 5 to 370 Röntgens per hour. But Slavsky pushed on, and his generals and managers delivered results. By July the 5th they had cleaned 800,000 square meters of territory around the nuclear plant, and 24,000 square meters of building surfaces with special solutions. Twenty-six construction battalions comprising 80,000 people with 9,000 pieces of machinery and equipment took part in the first stage of the construction of a concrete wall six meters thick around the ruins of the reactor to allow relatively safe access to the area. By the end of July, they had built the foundations of the future sarcophagus. Fifteen thousand square meters of concrete had been poured and it was estimated that 300 tons would be required to complete construction. But not everything went as planned. Slavsky's pet project of covering the reactor with an eight-ton aluminium cupola to be lowered onto the freshly constructed walls of the sarcophagus by helicopter went awry. As the helicopter transporting the cupola approached the reactor, the cupola dropped from the cable that secured it. The flight took place at a height of 400 meters and a speed of 50 kilometers per hour, read a KGB report describing the accident. The cupola fell to the ground and was shattered as a result. Fortunately, it did not hit the reactor or anyone on the ground. Rumor had it that Slavsky crossed himself and said, Glory to God. The idea of trying again was abandoned on the spot. The ceiling of the sarcophagus would be built of concrete blocks, like the rest of the structure. Slavsky's designers, engineers and military commanders, as well as reservists, mobilized by military commissars from all over the Soviet Union, worked in shifts, the first one lasting from mid-May to mid-July. A new shift arrived in mid-July and remained in place until mid-September. 
The third and last shift completed the construction of the sarcophagus in mid-November, only two months past the unrealistic deadline ordered by the Politburo in mid-May. By that time, approximately 200,000 workers had labored at Slavsky's construction site, building a 400,000-ton concrete sarcophagus that sheltered their country and the world from raging radiation levels emanating from the damaged reactor. Slavsky would come to the sarcophagus construction site every two weeks to check on its progress. The Chernobyl power plant was only one of his numerous battlefields. Another, no less important, was the Kremlin, to which Slavsky was invited on July the 3rd for a Politburo meeting convened to look into the causes of the Chernobyl accident, draw conclusions from it, and punish the guilty. Who was responsible for the technological disaster of biblical proportions? The personnel in charge who had ruined a supposedly perfect reactor through criminal disregard of rules and procedures, or the designers of the reactor in Slavsky's nuclear empire, which included the Kuchatov Institute? Depending on the answer to that question, Slavsky's position as head of the ministry, his reputation, and most important, his legacy would either be reaffirmed or trashed. Also at stake was the future of RBMK reactors and the Soviet nuclear energy industry as a whole. Slavsky was convinced that his subordinates could not possibly be at fault. When he had first heard of the accident, he had dismissed it as the doing and consequently the problem of a different ministry, that of energy, which operated the Chernobyl plant. Scholars at the Research and Development Institute of Power Engineering, directed by Nikolai Dolezal, the designer of the Chernobyl-type reactors, which was also part of Slavsky's vast nuclear empire, blamed Ukrainian specialists for the accident. The Chocheli exploded the reactor, claimed one of the leading scientists upon hearing the shocking news of the explosion. He used a derogatory term to refer to the Ukrainians, in this case the managers and operators in Ukraine, where the Chernobyl plant was located. The fact that Slavsky, Dolozhal, and the director of the Kurchatov Institute, Anatoly Alexandrov, were all either Ukrainians themselves or came from Ukraine, was of no significance. The thrust of the accusation was institutional rather than ethnic. Slavsky and his colleagues were seeking to deflect blame from his ministry and the Moscow Institutes to the cadres in the periphery. The working group put together on April the 29th by Boris Chichervina, the first head of the government commission to investigate the causes of the disaster, was led by Slavsky's deputy, Alexander Meshkov, and consisted largely of representatives of Moscow research institutes, Dolozhal's institute, which had designed the reactor, and Alexandrov's Kurchatov Institute, which had provided scientific support for the project. The working group began with six possible scenarios, but by May the 2nd it had pretty much decided on one. The reactor had exploded in the course of the turbine test as a result of violations of technical procedures by the operators of the plant. That became the nuclear establishment's official line. Those holding a different opinion largely kept it to themselves. The reactor exploded because the control rods were dropped during the emergency shutdown, one member of the group, Alexander Kalugin, quietly told another member, Valentin Fedulenko, on April the 29th, the day on which the group began its work. He meant that the explosion had resulted from the sudden spike in power output caused by the lowering of the control rods, a scenario predicted in a paper circulated among the nuclear scientists some time before the explosion. That explanation, which indicated that the designers were responsible, or at least partly responsible for the accident, never had a chance of acceptance among the scientists representing institutions that had designed the reactor. In mid-May, they reported to the president of the Academy of Sciences, Alexandrov, that the operator's procedural violations were solely responsible for the accident. Alexandrov, the scientific director of the reactor, approved that explanation. The government commission, headed by Boris Chichervina, took a similar approach. Chichervina did not entirely dismiss problems involving the design of the reactor, 
but in his report to the Politburo, which discussed the matter at its meeting of July the 3rd, he assigned primary responsibility to the operators of the reactor. The accident took place as a result of the grossest violations of technical regulations on the part of the personnel in charge and in connection with serious flaws in the construction of the reactor, read Shcherbina's report. But those reasons are not equally significant. The Commission finds that errors made by the personnel in charge were the basic reason for the accident. That conclusion became the official line endorsed by the Politburo and fed to the domestic and foreign media, as well as to the global scientific community. The former director of the Chernobyl nuclear plant, Viktor Bruchanov, who had been dismissed from his position in late May, was the first to feel the brunt of the new party line. In early July, when he was invited to Moscow to field questions from the Politburo, Bruchanov was still depressed and, as he later recalled, his attitude was one of indifference. Nevertheless, he remembered the setting quite vividly. There was a gigantic table in the walnut room of the Kremlin, with the eye of an engineer who had spent much of his career in construction. Bruchanov estimated that it was about fifty meters long and twenty meters wide. At the head of the table sat Mikhail Gorbachev, with Politburo members to his left and right. The meeting lasted from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. without a lunch break, although at some point waiters brought in sandwiches and drinks. Bruhanov was the third speaker on the agenda. He spoke for approximately 15 minutes, describing what he thought had happened at the plant on April the 26th. Gorbachev asked him only one question. Did he know what had happened at the Three Mile Island power plant in the United States in 1979? Bruchanov responded that he did. No one asked Bruchanov anything else. They thought they knew what had happened and what his role in those events had been. He was there as a scapegoat. After his presentation, Bruchanov sat down and listened to the rest of the discussion, which went on for hours. At the end of the proceedings, Gorbachev read a prepared draft resolution that proposed Bruchanov's expulsion from the Communist Party. The Politburo voted unanimous approval. Bruchanov, who had previously attended meetings of the Ukrainian Central Committee, conducted by the tough boss of the Republic, Volodymyr Szczecherbitsky, found Gorbachev's manner fairly weak. He would later call the General Secretary a spineless individual, Tryapka, an epithet often applied to Bruchanov himself by colleagues and subordinates. But ultimately, Bruchanov was relieved that no one at the Politburo meeting tried to humiliate him, as had often happened during his dictatorship in high party offices, where party secretaries had threatened to hang him by the balls as they demanded the fulfillment of plan quotas. No one now said anything of the kind to Bruchanov, but the media made him the primary culprit responsible for the disaster. The main Soviet television news program, Vremia, or Time, announced his expulsion from the party to the whole country. Everyone knew what that meant, the start of criminal prosecution, which would land him in prison. Such were the unwritten rules of Soviet justice, expulsion inevitably followed by imprisonment. In faraway Tashkent, Bruchanov's hometown, his brother would not allow their elderly mother to watch television, but neighbors told her what was going on she suffered a fatal heart attack. As far as the outside world was concerned, Yefim Slavsky and the president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, Alexandrov, emerged unscathed from the ordeal, but behind the closed doors of the Politburo, the situation looked different. What remains in my memory are strong impressions of general confusion. No one knew what to do, recalled Alexander Yakovlev, a key advisor to Gorbachev, and an architect of Pierestroika. The people responsible for that sphere, Minister Slavsky and President Alexandrov of the USSR Academy of Sciences, said something incomprehensible. At one point there was an amusing exchange between them. Do you remember, Yefim Slavsky, how many Rontgens we got in Novia Zimlia? And there's no problem, we're alive. Of course I remember. But then we had a litre of vodka each. 
They discussed their exploits at the Novaya Zimlia archipelago in the Arctic Ocean, which had been a Soviet nuclear test site since 1954. While the two octogenarians recalled the good old days, Gorbachev demanded an answer to a simple question. Was the reactor reliable or not? The answer was critical to the future of the Soviet nuclear industry and his own perestroika plans. If all RBMK reactors were to be decommissioned, there were twelve of them in various parts of the country, not counting the damaged one in Chernobyl, then the economic reforms Gorbachev was dreaming of would have to be suspended and alternative sources of energy sought. The Soviet treasury was already empty. Where could money be found to cover the losses generated by the Chernobyl catastrophe, to say nothing of decommissioning the rest of the RBMK reactors, which were responsible for generating 40% of all the electrical energy produced by Soviet nuclear plants? No one, including Gorbachev, knew how much it would cost to deal with all the different aspects of the disaster. Decades later, Belarusian economists estimated the overall price tag for their republic alone at 235 billion US dollars, or 32 annual budgets of Belarus as of 1985. Nevertheless, Gorbachev pushed for an answer. He wanted to hear the opinions of nuclear scientists from Slavsky's ministry and institutes, but they were silent or evasive. Eventually, Gorbachev gave the answer himself. The personnel are responsible for the fact that the accident took place, but the scope of the accident is due to the physics of the reactor. He asked Slavsky's subordinates whether RBMK reactors could still be built and operated. Slavsky's deputy, Alexander Meshkov, responded in the affirmative. They can if regulations are strictly adhered to. Gorbachev was not satisfied. You surprise me, he told Meshkov. All that's been collected about Chernobyl to date leads to a single conclusion. The reactor must be condemned. It's dangerous. But you are defending the honor of your uniform. Meshkov shot back. No, I'm defending atomic energy. Gorbachev was quick with his own reply. But which interests take precedence? That's the question we have to answer. That's what millions of people here and abroad demand of us. After reading the report on the causes of the accident, Gorbachev continued his attack on Slavsky's ministry. But Meshkov is blaming everything on the personnel in charge. Where does such a disaster leave you? If we agree with you, what then? Continue as before? Everyone is out of step but Meshkov? In that case, better to get rid of Meshkov. Everyone knew that the attack was really directed against Slavsky, who tried to defend his deputy and himself. The explosion was man-made, he told the Politburo. The reactor is fine with a long service life. But what did they do? After all, the experiment was carried out by a local engineer who had no right to do so. Gennady Shasharin, a deputy minister of energy responsible for the Chernobyl power plant, was fully on board, glad to shift as much blame as possible onto the designers. He told the Politburo, The physics of the reactor determined the scope of the accident. People were unaware that the reactor might speed up in such a situation. He added, The personnel are responsible for the accident, but its scope, I agree, is in the physics of the reactor. Shasharin was in favor of shutting down all existing RBMK reactors, as he could not guarantee their safety. That was a line Gorbachev was not prepared to take. Shasharin's statement, to shut down atomic energy stations, is not serious, he said. Still, realizing that RBMK reactors were unsafe, he sought a compromise whereby they could be made safer instead of being shut down and decommissioned. A cover, he asked those present, referring to the concrete container around the reactor, a mandatory safety feature at all U.S. reactors that was absent in Chernobyl. But building such containers was a very costly enterprise that the Soviet Treasury could not afford, as Gorbachev was well aware. Probably for that reason he immediately shot down his own proposal. They say that if there had been a cover in Chernobyl, the emission would have been even worse. The Central Committee Secretary in charge of nuclear energy, Vladimir Dolgich, also grappled with the question of what to do with existing RBMK reactors. 
reconstruction of the reactor from scratch makes it uneconomic, he said in response to Anatoly Alexandrov's proposal that the reactors could be improved. We are threatened with a huge loss of energy. After all, there are ten reactors of the Chernobyl type in Comicon, Council for Mutual Economic Assistance Countries in Eastern Europe, and ten in our country. They are all out of date and dangerous. The party ideological watchdog, Yegor Ligachev, was in favor of reducing dependence on nuclear energy. The structure of atomic energy must be changed completely. At present, irresponsibility is inherent in the very structure. Find alternative sources. Step on the gas. That Politburo meeting ended with the conclusion that the entire nuclear industry was badly in need of serious reform. While the operators were blamed in public, questions were raised privately about the safety of RBMK reactors in general. Determine the type of reactor, abolish the Chernobyl type, said Prime Minister Nikolai Rishkov to the Politburo. In drawing conclusions from the discussion, Gorbachev told his colleagues, The draft of the Politburo resolution must be revised with regard both to energy output projections and the balance between atomic energy stations, gas, oil, hydroelectric stations, and coal. The government must revise the program for the development of the energy sector up to the year 2000. We must consider whether it would not be worse to continue using atomic energy stations than to close them. That was anything but good news for Slavsky and his empire. But there was more. Many held him indirectly responsible for what had happened at Chernobyl. We have come up against the super-secret character of the Ministry of Medium Machine Building, asserted Dolgich, referring to the lack of external controls on Slavsky's nuclear empire. The authority of Slavsky and Alexandrov has become too great, said Rishkov, echoing Dolgich. He was determined to dismember Slavsky's realm, proposing that a Ministry of Atomic Energy be created. Part of the Ministry of Medium Machine Building should be assigned to it. An interdepartmental council should be established, not under Slavsky, but under the Academy of Sciences or the State Committee for Science and Technology, or, better, under the Council of Ministers. When Gorbachev read the list of people responsible for the disaster, and reprimanded in one way or another by the party, at the top was Bruchanov. Slavsky's name was missing. Gorbachev suggested that academician Alexandrov be made aware of his responsibility in this whole business, and that Slavsky's deputy, Alexander Meshkov, be fired. Slavsky himself was being spared for the time being. They still needed him to deliver the sarcophagus. The Politburo battle pitched Gorbachev, his aides and members of the Politburo against the nuclear scientists responsible for the design and construction of the reactor, who closed ranks around Slavsky. There was just one defector from their camp, Valery Legasov, the chief scientific advisor to Boris Chechervina's commission. At the Politburo meeting, Gorbachev often addressed his questions about the reactor to Legasov instead of to the father of the Chernobyl-type reactors, Legasov's boss, Anatoly Alexandrov. Has the commission established why the unreliable reactor was approved for production? That type of reactor was rejected in the USA, right, Comrade Legasov? asked Gorbachev, looking for support among the nuclear scientists attending the meeting. Legasov responded that the United States had never produced or operated Chernobyl-type reactors. The reactor fails to meet safety requirements according to the most important parameters, he told the Politburo. In Finland in 1985, physicists gave our atomic energy station high marks, but before doing so, we removed the automatic and technological components, substituting Swedish-American ones. Legasov later recalled Nikolai Rishkov's statement at the meeting to the effect that the Chernobyl accident was anything but random, as the Soviet nuclear industry had been heading toward it for a long time. Legasov was prepared to seek the causes in his own nuclear industry, the object of primary loyalty for his colleagues at the Kurchatov Institute. 
As far as they were concerned, Legasov, as deputy director of the Institute, was there to defend its interests and those of the industry. But as a loyal communist and believer in the Soviet system, he put the interests of the system above those of Slavsky's nuclear empire. Many suspected him of careerism. He sided with the Politburo against his own people, divulging their internal secrets. They would never forgive him for that betrayal. In early July, Legasov, who had sustained a high dose of radiation during the first weeks after the explosion, was back in Moscow, working on his own document, analyzing the causes of the explosion. Back in May, the Soviet government had promised Hans Blix, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, a report on the accident at an international conference organized by the agency. The conference was scheduled for late August in Vienna, and the Soviet government appointed Legasov to head a commission responsible for drafting the report. He embraced the task with his usual enthusiasm, gathering a group of experts ranging from nuclear physicists to health and ecology experts, turning his own apartment into the commission's drafting room, and working on the report around the clock. The forthcoming conference was getting a lot of attention in the West. The European political and scientific elites were extremely frustrated with the behavior of the Soviet government, which was slow in releasing any information about the accident, thereby jeopardizing the safety of the Central and Western European population. They were also extremely skeptical that the Soviets would say anything meaningful at the conference. Lagasov, who was well aware of those attitudes, called in one of his advisors, Alexander Borovoy, and, swearing him to secrecy, showed him the draft program and resolution of the forthcoming conference, where Legasov was scheduled to speak for a mere thirty minutes. They presumed that in its report on the Chernobyl accident, the Soviet Union would not say anything concrete, recalled Borovoy. Since those reactors belonged to the military type, everything would be kept secret, and the report would take only half an hour. After that, speeches were scheduled, the content of each stated in a phrase or two. It ended with a draft resolution of the IAEA for the Soviet Union to shut down all its RBMK-1000 atomic reactors, pay huge reparations to countries affected by the radioactivity, and ensure the presence of foreign observers at every atomic reactor in the Soviet Union. Legasov was eager to derail those plans. We'll have to overcome that, he told Borovoy. Legasov and a group of his hand-picked advisers sat working on a comprehensive report that would contain a detailed chronology of the accident and its consequences. It was impossible to do so without talking about the construction of the reactor, a top-secret subject in the Soviet Union. As was to be expected, Slavsky and his aides refused to permit the release of such information to the international academic community, putting Legasov in a difficult position. At the Politburo meeting of July the 3rd, the Minister of Energy, Anatoly Majorets, had noted the absurdity of the situation caused by the outdated demand for secrecy. It's apparent from foreign sources that the Chernobyl accident has already been modelled there, he told the Politburo. So what should we do? Present lies to the IAEA? Legasov, who could not have agreed more, went directly to Premier Rizhkov, who authorized him to proceed with the report. It would include not only information on the design of RBMK reactors, but also estimates concerning the amount of radioactivity released and its impact on agriculture and human health. Legasov was prepared to talk about everything. The Soviet report was 388 pages long, and Legasov got permission from the government to bring along experts on nuclear reactors who had been prohibited from leaving Soviet territory. This would be their first trip abroad. They were to answer specific in-depth questions dealing with their area of expertise. When Blix's aides asked the Soviet embassy in Vienna about the projected length of the Soviet presentation at the conference, they expected a report lasting about half an hour. They were told that the Soviet representative would be speaking for four hours. As it turned out, his presentation took even longer. The Vienna conference began on August the 25th. 
Legasov began his report with a discussion of the design of the reactor and a description of the Chernobyl power station. He continued with a description of the accident, an analysis of its causes, and a description of the impact, concluding with recommendations on how nuclear accidents could be predicted in the future. The report blew open much of the carefully designed shield of secrecy covering Soviet nuclear programs. The audience, consisting of close to 600 nuclear scientists, representing 21 international organizations and 62 countries, as well as 200 journalists, was stunned. Legasov's presentation was greeted with a standing ovation. No one who attended the first day's session will soon forget it, according to a report on the conference in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. The author of the report continued, On August the 25th, the conference mood was bleak and tense. By August the 29th, the last day of the conference, it had become cheerful, convivial, verging on the euphoric. Legasov became an instant celebrity, hailed by the Western media as one of the world's top ten scientists. His apparent openness about the causes and consequences of the Chernobyl disaster achieved the impossible, changing the image of the Soviet Union from that of an irresponsible perpetrator to that of a victim of unpredictable circumstances, open to sharing its experience and cooperating with the rest of the world to prevent similar accidents in the future. Despite such unprecedented openness, both about the Chernobyl nuclear plant and the Soviet nuclear industry in general, Legasov stuck to the party line in his Vienna report, blaming the reactor personnel for the accident. According to his report, the basic reason for the accident was the extremely unlikely combination of violations of procedure and mode of operation that the personnel of the energy station allowed themselves. This was the blame the personnel line taken by Slavsky and his deputy Meshkov at the Politburo meeting the previous month. But many in Moscow's nuclear establishment, and increasingly in higher party circles, believed that Legasov had divulged too much information about the industry, and immediately communicated their displeasure. Alexandra Borovoy, one of the co-authors of the report, met Legasov when he entered his institute upon returning from Vienna. Victory! shouted Legasov to Borovoy, running up the stairs to his third-floor office. In high spirits, he left to meet with the Soviet leadership. Borovoy saw him again upon his return to the Institute a few hours later. Legasov's demeanor had changed, his euphoria completely gone. They understand nothing and even fail to grasp what we managed to accomplish, he told Borovoy in despair. I'm going on leave. It is not clear whom Legasov met upon his return from Vienna, but there is little doubt that the country's highest officials, including Gorbachev himself, believed that he had pushed the glasnost, openness, envelope too far. At the July the 3rd Politburo meeting, Gorbachev had told his colleagues, There are no interests that might compel us to hide the truth. It is our duty to all mankind to render complete conclusions. By early October, Gorbachev was breathing more easily. Not without satisfaction, he informed the Politburo that, since the meeting of member nations of the IAEA, Chernobyl has ceased to be an active element of anti-Soviet propaganda. Legasov had scored a major propaganda victory for the regime, but it was not appreciated by the leadership. Responsibility to humankind clearly did not entail the need to inform the world community of all that Legasov knew about the accident. Many expected that on September the 1st, 1986, his fiftieth birthday, Legasov would be given the highest Soviet wartime award, Hero of the Soviet Union, for his work in Chernobyl. He was denied it, as well as the highest peacetime award, Hero of Socialist Labor. Instead, he was presented with a Soviet-made watch, an obvious insult, given the expectations that he and many others had at the time. Clearly, Legasov had little support at the top of the Soviet power pyramid. He had every reason to feel betrayed. He had supported the political leadership against his own academic institution and industry, only to be repudiated by both for saying in public what he believed absolutely necessary to tell the world about the causes of the Chernobyl accident.
Rumor had it that Slavsky, still running his nuclear empire, was opposed to bestowing the highest Soviet award on Legasov. If that was so, then it was Slavsky's last victory. By the fall of 1986, clouds were gathering on his horizon. Slavsky's closest ally, Anatoly Alexandrov, stepped down as president of the Academy of Sciences in October. He had asked for that at the Politburo meeting in July, taking his part of the responsibility for what had happened in Chernobyl. Slavsky, who never accepted such blame, was forced out of his position at the top of the all-powerful ministry in the following month. The government commission deemed the sarcophagus ready on November the 30th. A few days earlier, Slavsky was visiting the construction site at the Chernobyl power plant when he received a call from Premier Rishkov, who asked him to come to Moscow the following day. When Slavsky responded that he was too busy overseeing the completion of the sarcophagus, Rishkov gave him one more day. They are cooking something up. Slavsky told a subordinate who had overheard his telephone conversation with Rishkov. The meeting in Moscow lasted three hours. Rishkov assured Slavsky that he was satisfied with his work, but given Slavsky's age, thought it would be good for him to retire. Slavsky, who dreamt of making history by staying in ministerial office until the age of 100, resisted to the very end. On leaving Rishkov's office, he asked the secretary for a piece of paper and wrote on it, in his usual blue pencil, Please discharge me, as I am somewhat hard of hearing in the left ear. It was a sign of defiance, if not of hope, that the Premier would not sign a letter citing such a ridiculous cause for retirement. Slavsky did not hide his low opinion of the new leadership and its political course. He thought that his ministry needed no restructuring. As Slavsky saw it, he and his people had been outperforming all others without perestroika because he knew how to work better than anybody else. Slavsky's model of the Soviet economy was a militarized one. He saw no benefit in Gorbachev's reforms and despised his foreign initiatives aimed at easing East-West tensions. Not until a few weeks later was he convinced by his aides to write a proper letter of resignation. The era of the militarized economy was over. It had not only produced the Chernobyl disaster, but had also been mobilized to clean up its consequences. In retirement, Slavsky would remember the good old days and recite his favorite poet's verses from memory. Quoting with gusto the father of the Ukrainian nation, Taras Shevchenko, the romantic bard who glorified the pastoral beauty of Slavsky's homeland, he would intone, A cherry orchard by the house, above the cherries, beetles hum, the plowmen plow the fertile ground, and girls sing songs as they pass by. It's evening. Mother calls them home. Back in the early 1960s, Slavsky had strained his influence to the utmost to name a new city built around a uranium mine in Kazakhstan after his favorite poet. His patriotism was as much Soviet as it was Ukrainian. He saw no difference between the two. The Chernobyl disaster had destroyed the pastoral world celebrated by Chivshenko and remembered from childhood by Slavsky. The cherry orchards of northern Ukraine and parts of Belarus and Russia were now beaming radioactivity into the atmosphere, destroying life around them. There is no indication, however, that Slavsky ever felt himself or his industry to be responsible for the accident. He was prepared to take risks and deal with their consequences. Once before the Chernobyl accident, someone had asked him what would happen in case of a meltdown of a reactor core. It will be very, very bad, but we'll manage even that. He did indeed take care of what had happened at Chernobyl, but at tremendous cost. The Soviet nuclear lobby hoped that the sarcophagus would bury not only the damaged reactor, but also doubts about the whole nuclear program. Although party and government leaders were skeptical, they publicly accepted the narrative promoted by the nuclear lobby. The accident was blamed entirely on plant personnel. With the sarcophagus complete, Slavsky removed from his position at the top of the Soviet nuclear empire and its restructuring underway, and Alexandrov retired as president of the Academy of Sciences, 
the government was ready to go after Viktor Bruchanov and his subordinates, who, as far as the public was concerned, was supposed to take all the blame for what had happened at the Chernobyl power plant on the night of April the 26th.